um, let's just begin. Uh, and people, if you want to, if you want to um, ask questions, please unmute yourselves and do it, or drop your question to the chat, and I'll be happy to take it up. Uh, all right. So yeah, anytime now. Okay. Can you see the slides? Yep. Uh, okay. Great. Thanks everyone for showing up. I know it's uh, early morning on a Friday, so I appreciate it. And thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I am an assistant professor at the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management. So we're an interdisciplinary um, environmental graduate school. Um, and the work that I'm gonna be talking about today is collaborative with a group called the Climate Impact Lab, where we've got economists, climate scientists, computer scientists working together to build uh, high resolution estimates of the damages of climate change. And what I wanna talk about today is pulling together a lot of our work over the last about five to six years um, across many different categories of climate damages where we're working to pull those together to, to build estimates of the social cost of carbon. So the broad motivation behind our work in this space is a very simple fact, which is that mitigating carbon emissions is expensive. So we've all seen many graphs that look like this, where we see different climate futures that we face under different emissions trajectories. And we tend to sort of look longingly at this green line, which is a low climate risk future. But what we have to acknowledge and, and confront is the fact that pulling the world down from that high emissions future line in red to a low emissions future in green is expensive and comes at the expense of many other things that we like to prioritize with public policy, like alleviating, alleviating poverty or investing in our healthcare systems, investing in our educational systems. And so what's really difficult about this problem is that policymakers are looking at these different climate futures and they can assess the costs of a given climate policy that may lower emissions a given amount, but they don't know how beneficial or how valuable those emissions reductions will be for society. And so it's very diff difficult to weigh these policy options against the costs uh, of achieving them. And so that's where the SCC comes in. It's defined as the total external cost that is imposed by emitting one ton of carbon dioxide. You can either think about it this direction as we emit one more ton of CO2 and there's a cost that's imposed across the globe, or you can think about it as the benefit to society of averting one more ton of emissions. How to think about this in daily life, imagine driving your car uh, today. This is going to emit carbon, which will alter the atmosphere, not just today, but for centuries into the future. This will change the climate, not just where you live, but across the entire planet. And that will lead to corresponding climate changes that are local and alter many different dimensions of human well-being across the globe. So agricultural yields may change, our electricity demand may change, our human health effect, uh, effects may manifest. And so what the SEC asks is what is the total value of all of these changes um, one every time that we emit another ton? So that's sort of how to think about it at a personal level, but what, what we're really motivated here by is, is public policy. So how does the SEC shape climate policy? Well, for any type of, of mitigation policy that we may be considering, the SEC is what allows us to determine whether or not it is cost effective. So say, for example, you're thinking about a, a policy that will force auto manufacturers to develop electric vehicles instead of gas vehicles. Those auto manufacturers may come to you and say, this is how expensive it's going to be for us to redesign our factories and shift our manufacturing under this new policy. Those costs may be very salient. And what the SEC allows you to do is then value the benefits from allowing the uh, or forcing the auto fleet to become more um, uh, carbon neutral. You can then weigh those benefits directly against the costs. And so this allows you to assess policy trade-offs in sort of an apples to apples manner, instead of thinking about dollars on one hand and sort of changes in climate um, or changes in temperature on, on the other. So um, this is not just a, a little exercise that economists like to do uh, sitting on, on their computers in their spreadsheet. It's actually how a lot of uh, policy is, is, is conducted, particularly in the United States. And that's true in the United States because many of our laws and regulations actually force us to go through a cost benefit analysis before the law or the regulation is put into place. And since the Supreme Court ruling in 2007, that cost benefit analysis has to include the costs and benefits of, of carbon emissions. So after that 2007 ruling, the Obama administration put into place a government-wide SEC using the best available science and data and, and economics at the time, which gave a number of about $52 per ton. 
that number was used over the course of that administration to value over 80 regulations that were worth about a trillion dollars uh, in total benefits. Under the Trump administration, that number got lowered dramatically for a, a variety of sort of key levers were pulled in the, in the process of building the number that lowered it substantially. And that was used to justify many rollbacks of environmental regulations. For example, our fuel economy standards no longer passed a cost benefit analysis because the value of those emissions mitigations was much lower. Today, we've returned back in an interim manner to the, the current uh, the $52 number again. So we're basically relying on the number that was constructed over a decade ago under the Obama administration, while the Biden administration actively works to comprehensively reassess the science behind the SEC. That's sort of the story at the federal level. A bunch of different local level governments and actually individual companies, private companies, use the SEC to assess their, uh, their policy and business decisions. And then a variety of other governments uh, use SECs in a variety of different ways as well, either drawing directly on frameworks built in the US or building their own uh, SEC estimates. So um, why is it important to get this number right? Um, as you're gonna see, of course, constructing an SEC takes a lot of effort. Um, why is it so critical that we go back to that science and economics from 10 years ago and work really hard to update the number? Well, here's just one example of, of why this can really matter. Um, and, and the key point is that a bunch of different policies may no longer be viable if you use an outdated SEC. So what you're seeing in horizontal lines are estimates of the costs of achieving a bunch of different climate mitigation policies. And then these vertical lines are different estimates of the SEC. So all these costs that exceed the $51 um, outdated SEC indicate that those are policies that don't pass cost benefit analysis. But if we look toward current um, suggestive evidence like, that looks like the SEC is likely to rise, potentially to $120, maybe even farther, you can start to see the policies that then become viable as the, the number rises. And so, you know, where should this number be on the x-axis? We don't know, but like what's really important here is that we accurately reflect the value to society of reducing emissions so that we can fairly assess which policies pass this threshold and which do not. So keeping this number up to date and, and, and ensuring that it, that it reflects best available evidence doesn't mean just speaking to one academic literature. Each one of these components in this sort of multi-step process to getting an SCC reflects an entire scientific or economic literature and so what this means is that in computing and updating an SEC, it means that we need to go to individual scientific disciplines and integrate a bunch of different um, advances that have taken place since that SEC was originally constructed uh, over 10 years ago. So what's some evidence for why it's important to do this? The first is that the underlying estimates of how bad climate change will be for economies are very outdated. You're seeing sort of the core component of the three models that led to that $52 number here on the slide. Um, and these, of course, were very influential models at the time, but you can, you can see that some of them don't even have confidence intervals, and these were not empirically grounded in any way. And so we're relying really heavily on these three modeled estimates of damages to form uh, all of our current uh, climate policy here in the U.S. So one piece of evidence about, about where sort of the underpin, empirical underpinnings of these estimates come from, here you're seeing histograms of the empirical publications that inform the damage function estimates in these models. And you can see that they're very outdated and there aren't very many of them. So these little histograms are showing you when were these papers published and how many are there. These are very outdated estimates. A recent literature review that we've done at the Climate Impact Lab just shows that there's been this explosion of literature, which I know some of you in the room have contributed to um, explosion of literature that has allowed us to better understand what climate change means for societies and economies across the globe. But currently our policy tools are basically leaving out all of this new data and, and methodological innovation and new understanding. Another reason that we need to, to revisit this question and think back to that, that diagram of each of these components, there's an entire other literature that it, again it is out of date in the current model. So the current models have um, a climate model that uh, rely on a set of climate models that miscalculate the speed of warming. And this is really important because of course, discounting is gonna play a very big role in this calculation. And our uh, updated 
um, evidence suggests that the impact of a ton of CO2 on the atmosphere is actually quite quick in terms of its initial impact and then fades slowly. This is very different than what the outdated models show us, which sort of has this gradual uh, impact of that ton of CO2. So as soon as you start thinking about how discounting matters here, this can really change uh, our calculations pretty quickly. Finally, um, the spatial resolution of these models is, is, is really low. And so this is important because part of that explosion of new literature I just showed you has told us, has, has made very clear that the impacts of climate change are very unequally distributed across the globe. But unfortunately, the low spatial resolution of these models means we can't really even say anything about inequality because we're not resolving climate change impacts at a scale that allows us to say um, anything really useful about inequality. So what we're trying to do is sort of rethink how we can calculate the FCC using best available empirical evidence, best available climate science. We want to rely on data that are globally representative as opposed to going to places where it's easy to access data, which tends to be temperate and wealthy locations. We want to account for the fact that adaptation is likely to unfold as climate change gradually takes place, but also that that adaptation is expensive. And we want to be able to track and ultimately value the many different dimensions of uncertainty that play into this calculation. We are talking about hundreds of years into the future, and of course, there's a substantial amount of inherent uncertainty. We also want to be able to characterize those inequalities and, and ultimately value those inequalities when computing the SEC. So um, we've built a, a model to do this. We're calling it the Data-Driven Spatial Climate Impact, Lab, Impact Model. I know acronyms are annoying, but the main thing to highlight here is that this is data driven. So what you'll see is that our approach is really em empirics forward. We're going to be looking to history and to data to say how have societies and economies responded to climate events in the past and what can that tell us about the future. And this emphasis on spatial is that we're really going to be building high resolution estimates so we can think really carefully about, about inequality. So the way that we're going to do this is we're going to start with econometric analysis of the effects of climate change using evidence from history to think about the future and use um, empirical estimates using that historical data to build estimates of adaptation and how, how costly we think that adaptation may be. We will then go to other teams around the world that have built climate change and socioeconomic scenarios of the future to build projections of what the future may look like drawing on those literatures from other teams. This is going to allow us to, to, to characterize unequal impacts, as I said, but also to track uncertainty sort of through the entire process. Um, and th this sort of approach, it, it, it really reflects the difference between, you know, 12 years ago when the initial SEC was built um, to today, where data and the data and computing environment has just dramatically changed. And this type of analysis really wouldn't have been possible without the type of distributing, com distributed computing that we now um, have uh, accessible. There's a window into what this looks like. We're going to be thinking about climate change impacts at the scale of about 25,000 regions. We're going to be doing this with probabilistic climate models, which allow us to characterize not just the average expectation of what the future may look like, but all the uncertainty in, um, in that climate future. And we're going to be characterizing vulnerability to a given climate event at a very local level, capturing the fact that a hot day means something very different for the urban poor uh, in Delhi than, um, you know, the rural uh, populations in, in Minnesota and the U.S., for example. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over this, but hopefully this diagram gives you a little bit of a sense of what we're going to be doing. We're going to be starting with sector-specific analyses. So I'm going to start by building estimates of what climate change may mean for key sectors of the economy then bring those things together to build the SEC. So we'll be building from sort of a sector specific approach and then ultimately integrating these forward into the SEC. And within each one of these sectors, there's gonna be a pipeline that begins with data and econometric analysis, and then draws on climate model scenarios from other teams that, that allows us to, um, to, to get to value climate damages in the SEC. One thing I wanna highlight is that, you know, for climate policy, what we're really interested in is this overall social cost of carbon estimate. But what's sort of interesting from a researcher's standpoint is which different sectors really contribute most to this aggregate SCC. And so we'll also be showing you partial social cost of carbon estimates, which are basically the impact of each individual sector. So sorry, the impact of CO2 via each individual sector on the SCC. So we can sort of get a sense of which one's really important um, uh, in building that overall number. <laughs> 
Okay, um, so because this is a data driven approach, we really have to begin in a in a modular way where we we go sector by sector to build up these estimates of damages. It's not sort of theory forward in which we may think top down by drawing or theorizing what a damage function may look like. We are going to build damages um, from from data in each individual sector. This does importantly mean um, that, of course, there are going to be categories of impact that are currently not included in our number. And part of what we're trying to build here is a system that can integrate other people's work in different sectors that we haven't worked on, as well as you know, our own future work in, in additional sectors. So what you'll be seeing today are these, um, these sectors that you're seeing on, on the slide with a bunch of independent projections in under each one. So for example, in the energy sector, we'll be thinking separately about electricity consumption, which is largely used for cooling, as opposed to other fuels consumption, oops, sorry, which is largely used uh, for heating. And then sort of at the end of the talk, I'll bring these all together um, and give you a sense of, of how they, they pull together into an SCC estimate across all sectors. Okay, so um, I'm going to try to walk through the, the overall sort of um, six steps that get us from empirical data to an integrated multi-sector SDC. I'm not going to present one paper here. What I want to try to show you is how we use a very similar methodological approach um, across all the sectors to build these data-driven estimates of, of climate damages. And so what I'll be doing is going through each of these steps and showing you examples from different sectors or categories of impact. I'm happy to pause on any one of them and answer detailed questions about an individual sector if you're interested in it. Um, but I do want to, uh, I hope it won't be too much back and forth to see these individual sectors, but the idea is to show you that the, the underlying approach is really similar for each sector, but it manifests a little bit differently um, depending on, on which category of impact we're talking about. So we'll start with we're sort of explaining the data that we use um, and then talk about our empirical uh, econometric analysis. I'm going to very briefly touch on, on our approach to inferring adaptation costs. That's um, really the focus of, of my paper um, that I led on, on human health. I'm happy to talk about that if people are interested. Um, we'll then actually project into the future and look at sector-specific projections of what climate change looks like for sectors, translate those into dollar values in step five, and then ultimately give you an SEC at the end if, if I can pull it off in the amount of time that I have. Okay. So this being sort of a data-driven approach, uh, data collection is an incredibly important first step in the analysis. And this is going to look different in each sector given differential data availability. So in our, in our work on energy consumption, we're going to be relying on country level energy consumption data, which comes from um, the International Energy Agency. Uh, it's about 146 countries and we're gonna be pooling consumption across residential, commercial and industrial sectors and we'll be separately modeling, modeling electricity demand from uh, other fuels demand. So great spatial coverage in this sector, but of course um, you'll note not, um, not fantastic spatial resolutions. So these are country level estimates. And I'm sure, I don't need to say this, but please interrupt me with questions at, at any point. Um, for our mortality work, um, we have subnational mortality records that cover about 55% of the global population. Um, for most countries, these are age-specific annual mortality rates. Happy to talk about why India is a little bit different if people, uh, people are interested. They're roughly at the county or district level, um, depending on where you are in the world. As, an, as you can see in the bottom, their temporal availability really varies uh, across space. I'll be talking about this a lot, but there's some really important omissions in our data that um, are sort of unfortunate manifestations of data availability in the world today. You know, we would love to have better records in places like Sub-Saharan Africa. And so I'll be pointing this out throughout my talk, but we're going to have to rely on certain amounts of extrapolation to fill in uh, regions of the world and points of time that don't reflect our historical sample. And I'll, I'll be talking about that a lot. So can I um, just ask yeah. a question here? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, I noticed that you have, yeah, I understand that, you know, you might not have data on, this is about the mortality um, mm -hmm. on Africa, but I was, I, I'm surprised you don't have data on Canada and Russia. Um, why is that? Uh, yeah. So surely should be, uh, and the reason I ask is because they are cold countries. And so they, you would expect to see mortality effects, which are favorable actually. So yes. Yeah. And you will see that we estimate and that. Anyway, but we don't, yeah, yeah, sorry, finish your question, yeah. Um, 
yeah so it's also surprising you don't have australia and new zealand in there so is this just that you have to gather data separately for each country there isn't a, there isn't a global database or, um, or mortality that you would get from who or somewhere yeah great question so who does have a country level database that is globally comprehensive it is notoriously error prone so um for a variety of reasons like the subnational data allows us to look at local level highly non-linear relationships that really can get aggregated over at the global at the country level so that's one reason but even there looking at those data they were just really implausible jumps and gaps that i think that, that there are big challenges with the data quality there but you are right there's country level data from the who that we chose not to use for those reasons um and, and so instead what we are doing is going like statistical agency by statistical agency across the globe and trying to assemble as much data as we can um a few of the examples that you listed are just not publicly available so in canada you can pay a bunch of money for it um, and we considered it, but we also like that we can put all of our data up online and, and make this reproducible and shareable. So I think as we move forward um, with the SEC work, I think it's a great question to like decide whether we want to invest in increased data collection, even if those data sets are behind a paywall um, and other users can't replicate our analysis. Same thing for Australia. It, it exists, um, but it's expensive. For a couple other countries, um, we have since collected data. So we just got South Korea, and I think as we're looking forward, we will we will work towards integrating additional data sets, but it is sort of a game of adding them in as we go and trying to find places where they're publicly available. Thanks. Um, yeah, no problem. So in agriculture, these are this is estimates of, of cropped area at the scale of the spatial units that we have data for across the globe. Um, we're covering about 40,000 region by crop units and the crops that we'll be considering are maize, soybean, rice, wheat, sorghum, and cassava. A little bit of coverage in sub-Saharan Africa, not fantastic. Um, but again, you know, this is the same approach where we've gone by, you know, statistical and agricultural agencies across the globe to try to build these, these data up from the ground up. Um, in, in our impacts on labor, we're going to be thinking about um, time use and um, how changes in the amount, how the amount of time that people spend working responds to a changing climate. You know that Sam has worked in this uh, in this space, and we'll be relying on time use and labor force surveys from about thirty percent of the global population. Again, there's some really important uh, uh, gaps in, in these data, um, but you can think about these as the minutes that are worked per day for labor force participants, um, and and you can see the temporal ranges for the different countries on the bottom. Um, our coastal sector looks a little bit different. So uh, I sort of talked about how this pipeline looks very similar uh, across the sectors. This is the one case where things are, are going to be modeled a lot more structurally, given the many different sort of, um, particularly the climatological dynamics that are happening in the coastal sector. But we'll be thinking about both sea level rise um, and storm damages. And we'll be assemb we assembled data that both tells us um, about the exposure of buildings and capital at high resolution across coastlines, um, as well as changes in, um, in the hazards themselves. So that's sort of the historical data collection. Um, and in this second step, we're going to take that data to extract what I'm going to call impact relationships, which will link changes in the climate to key outcomes within each of those uh, sectors. So the basic idea is like um, many, many other um, uh, works in this space, both in economics and in a variety of other disciplines that are thinking about climate change impacts. We are going to use a set of semi-parametric controls to isolate random variation in the climate, which gives us a short run effect of a weather event on an outcome of interest. So for example, in the mortality case, We'll be regressing mortality rates that are age specific and observed at a subnational unit I on a flexible functional form of both temperature and precipitation. We're going to use a suite of fixed effects to isolate year on year plausibly random variation in those climate conditions um, uh, to identify the effects of weather on the mortality rate. We find something <coughs> on oh. average across our sample, um, just one second, that, that reflects a large literature in this space, a U-shaped relationship for vulnerable populations where both increased heat and increased cold raise mortality rates. Yeah, is there a question? Yeah, this is just on the coastal uh, data is that 
all coasts or uh, the specific countries? Um, all coastlines globally. Okay, all right, thanks. Yeah. Um, that coastal is the the one sector that I am actually not a co-author on the paper. It's been handled a little bit differently, so I will do my best to answer questions about their paper, but I will apologize in advance if it's not um, uh, not quite as one. Yeah. Sorry, one other clarifying question mm -hmm. on the previous slide. So uh, my apologies, I'm not very familiar with the literature, but when you're talking about temperature and precipitation, random variation. Yeah. Are, I mean, how, how are you identifying that in, in the sense that, uh, so for example, if you consider the, the regular weather patterns, I mean, seasonal changes, I mean, there is uh, an expected pattern when you would expect in the, in the summer months or monsoon, say for example. Yes. So what is exactly, I mean, how are you picking up these or what are you calling these random variations in temperature changes and precipitation? <laughs> Yeah, thanks for the question. And um, I definitely yeah. breezed over that really quickly. So there is a large literature in this space, but um, there's no reason that everyone would be familiar with it. So in the case of mortality, these are actually annual mortality rates. So you can think about sort of aggregating over that seasonality, but these same types of models are used with monthly resolution all the time. So the basic idea is to use spatial fixed effects to account for any average differential conditions across space. We know that hot places also tend to be different in many other dimensions than cold places. We don't want to be comparing mortality rates in Norway and Nigeria. Um, so we use those spatial fixed effects to isolate variation over time within Norway or within Nigeria instead of over space. So that's you know, one form of, of isolating um, variation. But the other important component is, of course, seasonality as well as gradual trends. We are living in climate change right now. And so there's going to be um, you know, uh, gradual trends in climate exposure at the same time that there may be other gradual trending dynamics that change your outcome of interest like mortality. And so we rely uh, on a set of space by time fixed effects to try to control for those general trends as well. Or if you were using sub annual data, you, you would use something like, you know, state by month fixed effects to pull out that seasonality as well. So in this case, we're going to be using um, country by year fixed effects that are age specific to address um, you know, that gradual change over time in a way that may be, may be country specific and may be differential by each age group. Okay, you got it, yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, so this sort of gets us the effect of weather and to the extent that you believe we've been able to isolate a component of variation in the weather that is random, we may believe that this is a causal relationship. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't allow us to say something immediately about climate change, which we know is likely to unfold slowly. So the effect, the fact that uh, it was very hot this summer doesn't mean that that will have the same effect on mortality as a future in which every single summer is that hot. And so what we do is we build on this model to allow the shape of that response function you just saw to itself depend on conditions in a location. So what you can do is just sort of heuristically think about this beta reflecting the weather sensitivity of an outcome of interest. We're then going to add to this model a, um, a set of covariates that determine how sensitive a given location is. So for example, if you are in a place that is on average hotter, like, um, like India as compared to here in temperate um, California, you expect those hot days much more frequently and people are likely to have adapted to that heat in the way that they live their lives, in the technologies that they invest in. And we will allow that average climate condition to modulate the weather sensitivity of the outcome. We'll also use income and then additional covariates that will depend on the sector. So for example, in, in agriculture, access to irrigation is incredibly important in determining your weather sensitivity um, of, of crop yields. So this sort of vector of covariates will vary across sectors, but the basic idea is we're going to let that weather sensitivity itself depend on a vector of other parameters. So just visually, what does this look like? In the case of mortality, if we go to the coldest regions of the world, our model predicts that the change in the death rate for the oldest population, which is the most vulnerable, is very high, over 15 deaths per 100,000 for one additional day at 35 degrees C. But if we start moving to warmer regions of the globe, we see this marginal effect decline, reflecting the fact that in the data, in the historical data, we see that populations are adapted to their warmer climate 
they're investing in, in some sort of set of behaviors and technologies that allow them to respond better to this climate. So if we keep moving to warmer and warmer parts of the world, by the time we get to the, the hottest decile global regions, we see that there's a much more muted effect of a hot day than there is in a place that rarely experiences that extreme heat. So this is a way, uh, by, by allowing this sensitivity to evolve with these climate conditions, we're capturing adaptation as we can see it um, in the historical record. So that's sort of an example from mortality, but this type of approach we use across all of our sectors and we can capture this differential vulnerability depending on the outcome of interest. It turns out in our work on, uh, on energy, that income is just by far the dominant factor in determining differential responses to a weather event. So this curve that you're seeing on the right is a sort of canonical energy temperature relationship that has been recovered in a bunch of papers that are written about the US and the EU. And we have built this sort of conventional wisdom that like, oh, both hot days and cold days, electricity consumption increases because people use electricity both for heating and for cooling. But what we see in our data, which covers far more of the global income distribution than prior work, is that this effect is much more muted as you move to lower incomes. So there's still a U-shaped relationship here, but in lower income light places, we don't see nearly the sensitivity that we do um, in, in wealthy places. Importantly, for the vast majority of the global population, there is virtually no response of electricity demand to temperature. These are populations that simply don't have access to technologies that would allow them to, to respond to the heat or to the cold. And so we've built a lot of our prior evidence off of curves that look like this, but most of the world um, looks unresponsive. And this is important if we wanna be able to just characterize differences today, but of course we're going to be projecting into the future. And so these differences are gonna become really important when we think about populations in the future kind of moving through this income space and changing their, their, their vulnerability um, or their sensitivity as time unfolds. So do I have this right that you um, consider uh, temperatures between minus five and 35 Celsius? Is that? Um, we are estimating a polynomial using the full distribution of daily temperatures. And so um, I think, I, I don't know if I know off the top of my head what the range is in our global sample. I'm pretty sure because this sample is uh, most of the globe that it would span beyond negative five to 35, um, but mm -hmm. I'm just showing you that portion of the distribution on this curve, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so that's sort of the story in, in, in energy, but this same type of approach we take to each of the sectors, basically the goal here is model this impact relationship, but also model how it modulates and depends on key conditions in a location. So in the case of how much do you work on a hot day, this is very intuitive. We basically find that your sector of employment is the key determinant of your labor sensitivity to, uh, to temperature. And so uh, for, for high-risk workers who are in agriculture, construction, manufacturing, we see a really steep drop-off on hot days. But uh, for those of us that, that sit in front of uh, a computer in an air-conditioned office building, we don't see uh, sensitivity of your, your labor supply to, um, to temperature. This tells us sort of how people are, are differentially sensitive today. But of course, if we think towards, uh, towards the future, the sectoral share of an economy in each of those two sectors is likely to unfold. I'm sorry, to change as climate change unfolds. And so we model how the proportion of the population in that low risk sector versus that high risk sector may depend both on how wealthy a population is and on what its average climate is. So that we can characterize both how sensitive a population is today, but then also, you know, as uh, as the economies in the U.S. and India unfold differentially over time, how will the share of the population in these two differentially vulnerable sectors uh, evolve into the future? Very similar with agriculture, the key difference here is that things like irrigation really matter. So um, your sensitivity to drought or to flood events is muted when you have access to irrigation. And so we're building crop, spe sorry, crop specific models like this that allow us to capture differential sensitivity of each crop's yield to um, a variety of different uh, covariates. And in this space, because the agriculture space is just so rich with prior studies, we use sort of a, a few machine, sort of basic machine learning tools to help us select model here because there's a really large set of, of possible weather events and average and, and um, covariate conditions that could determine sensitivity um, in this literature. 
Okay, I'm gonna move on if there's no more questions about the econometrics. So um, those econometric analyses allow us to think about sensitivity of a key outcome to a weather event. And the fact that I showed you key determinants that shape that curve, and in some cases, flatten it or allow populations to be less vulnerable or less sensitive to a weather event reflects benefits of adaptation. So the fact that a hot day um, in, in Seattle in the US that rarely experiences a hot day, that's very, very damaging to mortality rates. But that same event um, in a wealthy hot place like in, in Florida has a very muted event that reflects benefits of adaptation in Florida that Seattle doesn't have. But we don't want to project forward estimating damages from climate change, only giving populations the benefits of that adaptation in the future without counting uh, the costs. So in order to be that protected against a hot day, we're going to have to invest in air conditioning and cooling centers, and we're going to have to choose not to go outside in the middle of the day. All of these things are costly, and we want to be able to account for those costs, not just the benefits. So that's what this step is about. There's a bunch of um, theory in the in in the the mortality paper on this, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about it if people are interested. I'm just going to give kind of the basic intuition of how we do this, um, um, but I'm happy to answer questions if people are interested. So, basically, the idea is that what I've showed you so far reflects a model that allows us to estimate these betas, but also differential betas as climate change unfolds. So if a population gets wealthier, or the population demographics get older, or the population gets hotter on average, I can model these differential betas under different climate conditions and different income conditions. But if that beta declines, reflecting the fact that populations are less sensitive because their average climate is hotter, that's going to come at some cost to achieve that lower level of adaptation. And so we want to be able to include in our climate change projections, not just this term, which reflects the direct effects of climate change accounting for the benefits of adaptation, we also want to account for the fact that that adaptation will be costly. So whether that is in Holland, building a bunch of greenhouses to protect your crops against adverse climate conditions, or whether that's in India, where everybody is having to put in multiple um, air conditioner units into their apartment buildings, those are not free adaptations, and we want to be able to try to infer those costs. Of course, measuring all these costs directly is really difficult. Some of them are behavioral things that people are doing, sacrifices they're making and how they spend their time during the day. They may be direct pur purchases like air conditioning, but we don't know how, we don't have a means of enumerating all of the many different behaviors that people will make um, in adaptation. So instead, we're going to rely on a revealed preference approach that's going to rely on a few um, key simplifying assumptions that will allow us to back out an estimate of what these costs may be. And the basic intuition from this approach is that people are going to invest in adaptive behaviors and technologies only up until the point where the marginal cost of doing more just equals the marginal benefit of, of investing more. So I moved to Santa Barbara from Chicago in Chicago. I lasted like three summer days before I, I bought an air conditioner for my apartment. It was definitely worth the cost of the air conditioner to enjoy the rest of the summer without suffering the discomfort of hot days. Here in Santa Barbara, I maybe get one or two days a year where it might be nice to have an air conditioner. It's not worth me investing in that air conditioner because the benefits that I get are just too, too small. So if we assume that people are rational and they're making these investments, we then can use those empirical estimates of the benefits of adaptation that we just talked about on the last section to infer what the est infer estimated um, estimated costs. So when I said I, I can see in the data differential adapt differential dose response curves or differential vulnerability that reflects benefits of adaptation, I will infer those are equal on the margin to the costs, and then we will back out estimates of adaptation costs using this approach. So um, this is sort of the, um, the approach that we can use in a few sectors. So there are a few sectors where this type of revealed preference approach can, can sort of directly be applied. We're going to use that in mortality to back out many unobserved costs that people incur to protect themselves against heat. We'll use it in agriculture to reflect the many unobserved costs that farmers incur to, to respond to a changing climate in, in, um, in their crop, um, in their varietal choices, et cetera. In um, coastal, we're relying really heavily on a, a structural model by Delavane Diaz, which we've recalibrated and, and sort of re-estimated with new data. 
Um, but her model sort of builds in a revealed preference approach that we um, that, that we are not sort of separately estimating. And then in labor and in energy, there's going to be sector, sectoral reallocation in labor where we don't have a means of using the same type of revealed preference. So we're going to have to be allowing that sectoral reallocation to take place without those, those costs. Um, and then in energy, energy demand itself is the adaptation. And so here we're not going to be capturing uh, uh, costs. But for mortality and agriculture, we'll be using this revealed preference approach to back out um, estimates of costs. Can I, can I just ask you a little bit more about yeah. this? Because I don't think I'm... Yeah. I, I don't think I understand it. So basically, your your marginal adaptation cost is just your marginal damage, right? Um, um, by because yeah. go, go ahead. Is that, is, that, is that right? It's your marginal benefit. So, um, for example, if you look at these two curves. What you're seeing in blue is the yield sensitivity in a cold location, and in red is the yield sensitivity in a hot location. And this difference is, is the benefit of adapting. That hot place has expected those hot days. They've invested in adaptive technology. So when they get hit by a hot day, they suffer a lot less than the place that is not adapted. And so this difference, you know, convolved with the distribution of temperatures gives you the marginal benefit of adapting if those two climates were marginally different. And that gap is what we infer as the, the marginal cost. Um, so I'm not sure what the margin here is. So could you, mm -hmm. uh, because this is going to be really important for your estimates, I think. So if you could spend a little bit more time, what, yeah. what's the margin here when you say, um, the, the difference between the hot and the cold place? So you mean you said um, that supposing the difference was just one degree? Yeah, so um, I think maybe I'll try to go through it visually and hopefully this, this will help, but we'll see. So, so um, imagine you can choose how much adaptation you want to invest in. Over here, you're not very adapted. Over here, you're very adapted. We don't know what you're doing to get adapted, but this is sort of your axis of all the decisions you can make to, um, to adapt. You're facing some unobserved cost function in gray that say is, uh, is convex and increasing. So we have higher costs of achieving that, um, uh, of more adaptation. There's also a benefit function, which tells me how many lives I save in a given location based on how much adaptation I've invested in. So um, my, uh, if, I, if I don't invest so in very much So this graph is conditional. So, so this yes. graph is conditional on, on a temperature and exactly. on an income in your models. Is that right? Exactly. So you know, this, this red curve would be some cooler place, T, where your optimal amount of adaptation, given what that cost function is, is down here, but somebody else's mortality benefit at a hotter climate, they're gonna have a higher mortality benefit of ad adapting because they're getting hit with those hot days more often. Their curve is going to look slightly different. Each location finds their optimal amount of adaptation given a shared cost function that they face. And then when I'm saying their marginal benefits of adaptation, it's the difference between this T average climate T and then a slightly hotter climate uh, T plus delta T. So what we assume is that these marginal adaptation benefits, oops, sorry, from jumping between one and the other um, are approximately equal to the costs. And that will be true if you sort of move delta T towards zero and these converge in the limit. And, and what and are what you changing? So, so, so what are you changing when you go from one curve to the other? You did say you're changing temperature. Yes, right? we are going to always- That's what differentiates two places. What yes. else? So um, only the climate will be used to infer the estimate of adaptation costs. We will condition in all the empirical estimates on income, but we will only allow changes in their climate to drive changes in adaptation costs. And that's important because as India gets wealthier as a century unfolds, Lots of people will invest in air conditioning that haven't in the past, but that's not an impact of climate change. That would have happened whether climate change unfolds or not. So the only marginal benefit that we're counting when we infer the cost is due to the change in the climate, not due to changes in income. 
That's a consequential assumption. Right. I'm just thinking that is a yeah. consequential assumption, right? Because absolutely the, the, the marginal benefits should depend typically on income. So you might be more willing to uh, you might get a higher benefit from your adaptation, let's say. If you're richer. The example, yeah, exactly. The example you mm -hmm. gave from moving from Chicago to Santa Barbara. Yeah. Uh, it might not be worth it for you if you had a different lower income level, for example, in Chicago itself. Yes. So, so that assumption yeah. is consequential, right? And, and, and that's being inferred from data with a given distribution in which your temperatures are correlated with your incomes. I totally agree. So what that um, looks like, yeah, great point. What that I'm looks just trying like to think how that will affect your estimates. Which direction will that go? Oh, that's a good question. Um, let me see if I can think about that on the fly. So the way that, that your point manifests in our actual estimation is that the effect of your average climate on your sensitivity is separate from your effect of income on your sensitivity and what you have just mentioned is an, it would be an interaction effect between climate and income such that the returns to adapting a little bit more the marginal mortality benefits of adapting would depend on your level of income and you know we empirically rule that out by showing we don't really see evidence of an additional interaction effect in the data but you know I, I'm not I can totally there are legitimate stories in which you could see that could be true. And you are right that our empirical estimates of, of adaptation and of adaptation costs would change if we allowed there to be an interaction effect between, between climate and income. Yeah. Um, which direction? Would, well, I think what direction it goes depends on, on what direction you think that cross partial is. And uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I would have to, I'd have to think about it more. I definitely will, but I, I'm not sure I have a strong enough prior on which direction I think that that interaction might, might go. Well, you'd expect more adaptation if you're richer, right? Because the benefit, uh, typically the, the monetary value of the benefit will be higher to you. Because yeah. you have a lower marginal utility of money, right? If yeah. You that way. Yeah. Yeah, but so this, the, what's tricky is that this is like, um, the function is nonlinear, and so you have your at hotter climate both affecting your cold side and your hot side, and so um, it, it uh, it's not it, the effect of climate itself depends on the temperature that you're evaluating it. So I, I, I agree with you in that intuition, but it might it will affect the two sides differently. And then we've got a, as you'll see, we'll see we have a lot of lives being saved in the north, and so the effect might go the other way in in, in the north if we estimated the interaction, but yeah, yes, you're totally right. Um, okay, great. In the case of mortality, I'll actually show you that the estimated costs don't really change the picture all that much, but the income effects are really large. And so it is true, your, your idea is totally true. It's possible that, that that story could change if I allowed income and climate to interact. Um, Okay, so now we want to take um, those empirical relationships, the structure and assumptions that we've placed in order to back out some estimates of adaptation costs, and then use those to project what the future may look like in each of these sectors under a variety of different climate change uh, projections. So we want to do this at high resolution. This is important, uh, not just because you know we, we want to <laughs> have a bunch of projections, but because as you saw in those figures, there is a lot of evidence of differential sensitivity based on average conditions in a location. And so as soon as you think about sort of the spatial distribution of climate and income, it can become really important to capture this at high resolution if we want to fully um, cap capture differential uh, impacts of climate change. So what we're gonna do is create what we're calling impact regions. These are sort of our standardized unit of analysis in projections. They are going to group together existing political units like counties or districts, roughly are comparable in population size and roughly internally homogenous in terms of their climate. And then we're basically going to use those empirical relationships that I showed you before to interpolate response functions for the regions of the world for which we don't have data and then ultimately into the future as well. So you saw this before, this is the spatial scale at which we'll be generating these uh, impact relationships. 
And so how do we how do we go from a map that looks like this, where our mortality data were, for example, to filling in estimates across the rest of the world? Well, basically, um, we have a model that says, given your average climate and your average income, I can predict your weather sensitivity in any location. So what this map is showing is your weather sensitivity of this most vulnerable group, the 65 plus group, where this dark red indicates places where populations are most sensitive. These are in China, for example, very cold and very and relatively poor uh, places. So then we um, assemble the data that gives us this average climate and average income at the scale of each one of those uh, impact regions to then infer what sensitivity will look like um, in, in the rest of the world. So we will fill in the rest of the globe that will estimate heterogeneity across the globe using the evidence that we have from the sample of countries that we have extrapolating out to places that we don't that we don't have data. What you can see here sort of manifesting is the role of, of income and climate. So places that are, are very cold are very sensitive to a hot day, but also places that are very poor. So even places that are experiencing a lot of these hot days in sub-Saharan Africa are sufficiently poor that their response is quite high. Sorry, my mouse keeps flipping the slide. Um, so you all should, you know, feel, I think you do, slightly uncomfortable about this amount of extrapolation. And it's really important to be, you know, I think this so is just the best a, just available. a question. Yeah. Hmm? Uh, sorry about that, but just a question on uh, when you say the mortality response, uh, is that in terms of lives or is that are you doing a monetary, uh, are you doing evaluation and converting that? Not yet. So these are just deaths per 100,000 from one single hot day. It's just like how steep is that response function at this point? That's all it, all it says in deaths. Okay. Yeah. Um. So this sort of our ability to make this extrapolation depends really heavily on how well our sample covers the space of income and climate today and into the future. So this gray blob represents the distribution of um, annual average temperature and GDP per capita across the entire globe today. And this is what our sample looks like. So the really important omission here is in this very low income space. We're relatively spanning, spanning climates Gosh, spanning climates pretty well, but we're really missing low-income populations. So in the uh, new version of the paper that hopefully will be up on NBER this week, um, we've added a lot more tests, particularly using cross-validation, to try to think about how we can assess the plausibility of our model out of sample, where we really just don't have data for these poorest populations. Um, in the future, it looks a little bit better, but then, the, you know, the out-of-sample extrapolation looks different, right? Now we're moving into places, into temperatures that we've never seen before, and into some incomes that are richer than we've never seen before. So again, we do a bunch of checks to try to assess how well we think uh, we, we can do, and then, um, you know, sort of sensitivity analyses, changing assumptions about extrapolatability. But this is sort of, this global representation comes only from our ability to sort of take what we can from the historical data that we have and try to infer what we think uh, vulnerability looks like everywhere else. Um, so when we do this, this allows us to, to not just think about differential sensitivity across space, but also across time. So um, this is what our, our, our mortality vulnerability to heat looks like today, but if we tack on top of that a climate change projection and a projection of income, we start to see this map getting later as populations adapt um, under, uh, under future years. So here in 2050, we're seeing a more muted map. By 2080, even more adaptation. And by 2100, we're seeing much more adapted world to heat than we saw um, at the beginning of the century. This reflects those benefits of adaptation, uh, both from changing climate and from income. So what does this look like when we add up impacts across the globe? Um, this is the as an estimate of the total aggregate change in the death rate due to climate change under a high emission scenario over the coming century. And we show you first just a benchmark model that doesn't account for any future adaptation. So we don't allow populations to change their sensitivity at all into the future, which a lot of prior studies have done. We have really large effects of, of climate change. So over 200 deaths per 100,000. Auto fatality rates in the U.S. are a lot around like 12 deaths per 100,000. But this looks quite different when we account for income growth. So the fact that income really modulates your sensitivity lowers our projected deaths quite substantially. Accounting for climate change lowers this even further. 
And then if we um, add in those inferred estimates of adaptation costs, this rises slightly to about 85 deaths uh, per 100,000. Um, so still, while this is much smaller than the sort of benchmark case, these are still really um, large quantities of, of death risk by end of century aggregated across uh, the globe. Of course, there's a lot of uncertainty in these numbers. So we conduct Monte Carlo simulations that trace through from econometric uncertainty to climate model uncertainty to give us an entire sort of distributional range of what the future may look like. And you can see that while a lot of the mass um, in these projections is above zero, there's substantial uncertainty in the magnitude uh, of these estimates. And we want to carry that through all the way towards uh, a social cost of carbon estimate at the end. This is mortality. I've been focusing a lot on mortality, but this type this, of this graph. Uh, hmm? Sorry, just a question. This graph is the net, right? After you put in the adaptation cost. Um, yes, this one in gray is yes. Um, but that is, I think there are about 14 deaths per 100,000 at the end. So it's not, it doesn't change it too much, but yeah. Um, and then these are, these are what um, similar curves look like for other sectors. So in electricity, we're seeing increases in electricity consumption, but that is uh, largely balanced out by substantial declines in other fuels consumption. We are um, seeing increases in sea level rise damages, declining labor supply, and um, depending on the crop, uh, potentially really substantial declines in, in, in crop yields as well. These are aggregate global damages. As we've been discussing, these are highly unequally distributed across the globe, as well as differentially uncertain across space. So the map shows you the average projected impact of a high emission scenario on mortality rates in 2100. Uh, but these little distributions show you that there's substantial uncertainty around each of those estimates arising both from the econometrics and from um, uncertainty around the climate system. Again, uh, some, this is both the mortality risk plus the, the inferred adaptation costs. This um, inequality manifests across the sector. So we, we see this sort of mirror uh, effect looking uh, pretty similar in a lot of crops where this overall, we're seeing this story in which the global poor and the places that are already quite hot are those that are projected to suffer the largest damages across uh, across all these sectors. A couple different ways that, that we can sort of learn about the nature of these damages um, because of the spatial resolution that we're projecting these at, what we see in, in mortality is that income, which is on the x-axis here, is highly predictive of the proportion of your damages that are likely to come from deaths versus from adaptation costs. So in poor regions of the world, we're seeing really large increases in death risk, but in wealthier regions of the world, at least some of them, we're seeing more increases in adaptation costs. So it's really looking like a story in which a lot of wealth, wealthy places are paying more to protect themselves against uh, uh, against climate change, but in these uh, in these poorer places, we're seeing uh, the impacts manifest as as real death risk. In the case of, of agriculture, we actually see something quite. What different. are the bars here? Oh, these are ranges across all the impact regions that fall into that decile. So uh, these distributions over the twenty five thousand regions, and and so the the heterogeneity comes from sort of spatial heterogeneity within each decile. Okay. Um, in agriculture, we actually see some of the biggest effects happening um, oh, sorry, in, in wealthier uh, regions of the world and the more temperate regions. So these tend to be some of our like biggest bread baskets uh, of the world. We're seeing some of the, the largest impacts. So it looks slightly different than um, sort of income story than we see um, uh, in, in, in mortality. Um, isn't I think- a, a, isn't, isn't this particular thing uh, contradicting the larger literature. Yeah, the um, in result. Yes. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't. Uh, I'm not sure how much people have investigated the income dependence of the response function. So one key result in this paper is that, um, which actually has been reflected from some work within the United States, but I think you know we should take that with a grain of salt because income gradients are quite small relative to the global income distribution, but. Um, we see that higher incomes increase your sensitivity to hot days. And that we, you know, <laughs> tested that every which way to make sure that it was really in the data. 
there are other correlates. Like I think we should we all want to you know I don't want to overstate these results, but that's a really so, so here consistent you're talking about spatial data. income variation in the yeah. U.S. and you're, no. uh, you're referring to yields on, on the left hand side. Yeah. So yield responses to temperature look more extreme in wealthier locations. In our sample, we see that in our global sample. Other papers have found that within the United States. Um, but the there's some, you know, the theories from the agronomists are that a lot of the highest um, average yielding seed varieties that wealthier people pay for actually do well on average, but but sacrifice um, sensitivity to extreme conditions and that farmers are making that choice um, in, in wealthier locations, they have access to these crops and on average they're getting a better yield, but they're doing worse as it gets hotter. So that's like right. a theory right. that I've seen in a few papers, but um, we see that sort of consistently in, in our paper. And I, I don't think I know of other papers that have done that sort of at this scale and, and have a climate change projection that includes that income effect. Right. Um, and okay. Right. Got it. Okay. Thanks. No problem. How about uh, adaptation costs, uh, like by the income decides here? What are the adaptation costs? Right. I don't. Um. I don't have that for agriculture. It's a great question. Um. It can depend quite a bit on crop, and so. Uh, here, this is maize, and I realize that I that doesn't say maize, so I should have that on the slide. But um, yeah, I don't want to answer because I'm not 100% sure based on crop. I think it could look a little different, but but yeah, I, I can add that to the slide deck. I don't have it. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to skip over uh, coastal, but the sort of the scale that we're doing are these sort of individual seg coastal segments and, and the adaptation takes the form of whether you're deciding to invest in protect protection or invest or choose to proactively retreat from a rising sea level. And we see sort of heterogeneous adaptation being chosen across the globe based on a cost function that's largely parameterized by the Diaz model um, uh, that, that we're using in this sector. Um, okay, so those projections give us um, a sense of physical quantities of impact, so percent of yield losses or increase or decrease in the mortality rate. What we're working towards here uh, is the social cost of carbon. We want to be able to monetize these things, uh, particularly for the usefulness in, in public policy. So now I want to translate what you just saw into uh, empirical damage functions that, that monetize these damages and help us think about the shape of aggregate damages as warming unfolds. So to do that, we're going to take this distribution of projections that I just uh, I told you about, where, which are characterizing uncertainty in the econometrics, as well as uncertainty in the climate. And we're going to index each one of those projections against the magnitude of warming from that climate model. So you can think about each one of these dots as like aggregating global damages across a map of the world across those 25,000 regions reflecting one Monte Carlo simulation, one climate model, uh, one, one year. And then our different climate models place these projections on different points on this x-axis. These blue dots are going to reflect a moderate to low emission scenario, and then these red dots come from simulations with a, with a high emission scenario. And so what this sort of distribution allows us to do is then empirically estimate a damage function. Now, of course, in every sector, getting to this graph means a bunch of work to turn something like death risk into a dollar value. Um, mortality is probably the most controversial one of, of all, and so I'm happy to talk about the, the different way, many different ways that we we've, we've done this. Um, but you know, the same approach needs to happen with increases in kilowatt hours demanded using projections of prices to turn that into dollars. Yields, we need to turn those using uh, using a model of projected prices to turn those into dollar values as well. So there's a step behind these dots that involves monetization for each one of the sectors. In this case for mortality, we're going to be using a value of a statistical life that does vary um, across those 25,000 regions using an income elasticity of one. We show in the paper um, how those estimates vary quite substantially if you, if you make different assumptions about the value of a statistical life. So these are what these damage functions look uh, look like across different sectors. So um, based on what you saw before, as you might expect, 
agriculture is downward sloping, we are increasing electricity demand as climate change gets um, more severe, but decreasing other fuels consumption, which is largely used for heating. This is um, labor damages coming from the form of, of, of lost hours of work and, uh, and coastal damages here um, in the middle on the upper right. So these, um, the climate models that we use and the socioeconomic scenarios that we use stop in 2100. Um, a lot of prior estimates of the SCC suggest that a substantial share of damages um, are likely to occur after 2100 based on dynamics in the climate system, of course, depending on your discount rate. Um, and so in order to generate estimates farther into the future, we have to extrapolate damage functions that we estimate historically using our projections into to years that go beyond 2100. So this is an example from labor where we use variation in Dam shape of damage functions up to 2100 to then infer a projected damage function into the future. Of course, we show lots of robustness and show what happens if you just fix the damage function at 2100, but basically we're going to rely on this damage function extrapolation to allow us to get uh, projected numbers that go, that go beyond 2100. So the power of this damage function is that is that now all we need to do to conduct an SCC calculation is figure out basically where we are on the x-axis. So there's a global mean surface temperature on the x-axis and we are going to pulse the atmosphere with a ton of CO2, trace that ton of CO2 into changes in concentrations uh, in the atmosphere. It has a dynamic effect on global mean surface temperature. And then this panel C is what was on our x-axis of our damage function. So we can trace that pulse through average temperature change into a dynamic trajectory of damages. Here, I think we're looking at uh, mortality damages, which then to compute the SCC, it's the present discounted value of that stream of damages, which arises through that estimated damage function. Again, we're gonna be thinking hard about uncertainty here, um, resampling the, um, the climate model that does this pulse of CO2 and translates it into temp temperature and then using um, a, a statistical uncertainty in the estimated damage function itself to compute um, a distribution of, of SCCs. Uh, I had a question. Um, so like in the panel, in panel D, there's the, and the uh, confidence interval, I think the functional uncertainty. Uh, it's uh, quite large for uh, 2100, which is like the end year projection of RCPs. But uh, why does it narrow down given that uh, extrapolation farther on time will uh, like theoretically will it at least intuitively suggest that the uncertainty will arise, but it just narrows down. Why? Yeah, sorry. In which panel are you, are you saying in D or in C? In D. In D, yeah, yeah. So D is um, combining the uncertainty in the climate system with the uncertainty in the damage function. This is all discounting. So this is a discounted stream of damages. It's it, the only reason that this is shrinking is that those damages start getting discounted and discounted so much towards zero that that, that uncertainty just doesn't uh, matter anymore. So that is really just arising through, um, through discounting. So of course this graph would look different if you chose a different discount rate. Thank you. No problem. So um, when we do this sort of systematically across um, sectors, the basic picture that we're getting here is, um, is one in which our estimated sector specific damages just look very, very different from the models that are currently sitting behind the SCC. So um, over here on the left, you're seeing the all sector SCCs that are currently used by the US government and by um, other foreign governments. The gold is this current interim SEC, which basically was from 12 years ago. This was the Trump SEC that had a lowered, uh, much higher discount rate and only counted damages within the US. And then what you're seeing on the right in gray are the sector specific SECs that are uh, behind one of the models that forms the, the gold bar. So only one of those models allows you to decompose at aggregate damages into sector specific damages. And, and so that's what we're comparing to in gray. And then in blue are our estimates of sector specific damages. So in energy, we find that that other fuels consumption decline actually outweighs the energy consumption increase. Um, there's really interesting heterogeneity there. So like in India, the electricity demand in impacts are, are really substantial in terms of thinking about the electric sector and, and how it's going to respond. But when we sort of pool everything across fuels and, and, and across the globe, we see this sort of very small decline. In contrast, 
the um, models from around 2010, energy is an enormous component of the aggregate SCC. So this is a very different story than, than what we saw in the original models. In mortality, the estimate was uh, very low but positive, and now we're seeing that our mortality estimates, of course, this will depend on the VSL, but this is true across many different valuation assumptions. The mortality um, component really dominates um, our SCC. We um, compute our labor, our, we value our labor damages using um, a simple labor model and an elasticity of labor supply that allows us to back out the disutility that laborers face from working under extreme conditions. So this is a component of labor that is not currently included in any of the existing SEC estimates. So of course that's a different number. And then our agriculture estimate, again, flips sign largely because this, um, this number is dominated by uh, CO2 fertilization. So overall, um, it's just looking like the, the picture is quite different, both in terms of aggregate numbers, as we'll see in a second, but particularly in terms of the sectoral composition of the SEC. Okay. A couple more minutes. Um, so now I'm going to just, hopefully this will be pretty quick, I'm just going to basically pull all that evidence together and try to give you a sense of what the number looks like when we pull uh, across these sectors and try to get an aggregate estimate. So um, a bunch of really interesting uh, and important questions sort of come up here as we think about building an aggregate SCC using the type of estimates that we've constructed. Um, and this is because there's a really large um, often theoretical literature in the SEC space that thinks about the importance of this one foundational economic concept, declining marginal utility of consumption, for three different aspects of the climate change problem in the SEC. One is valuing uncertainty. So there's a risk premium if we've got um, if, if we've got declining marginal utility of consumption, there's going to be a risk premium, and we should be thinking about that really carefully when we are when we are characterizing all of this uncertainty that I've just shown you uh, throughout the calculation uh, of climate damages. That same uh, concept sits behind the idea of equity weighting, the fact that climate damages um, for me look very different than climate damages for Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, me, it only arises because we think we have convex utility functions, which would imply that we potentially should be weighting those damages differentially based on the incomes of the populations that are getting hit by those damages. And then finally, the same concept underpins the argument for endogenous discounting instead of using a constant discount rate. The reason um, uh, the, you know, the, the constant discount rate may be something that we can use based on market, uh, an argument about market discount rates, but the same declining marginal utility of consumption justifies an endogenous discount rate driven by the magnitude of economic growth and the magnitude of climate damages. So what's exciting, I think, about our estimates is that we can actually kind of quantitatively assess these three points in a way that has been difficult in the past because we've got this high resolution set of impact regions. So you can think about equity weighting when you have 16 regions, but it's a lot sort of richer of a space to think about when you can characterize um, um, inequality at a higher resolution. We've also characterized uncertainty across many different sources. So we have these full distributions where we can actually think about valuing uncertainty. Um, and then, you know, everyone can do endogenous discounting if they want, but um, we can also sort of address that here. So what I'm gonna do is sort of show you a, just a, a window into many of the SEC estimates that we have that sort of highlight some of the key dimensions of decisions that need to be made at the level of integration that can really influence the number. And then, I will point you towards our, our work in progress, which is um, at this stage, this part is led by Ishan Nath, who's at the San Francisco Fed. And um, that paper will have sort of many different um, sort of valuation assumptions sort of unpack many different numbers. So first, if we just start by looking, you know, ignoring uncertainty, applying a constant discount rate and not valuing equity at all, and we just take a mean over this large distribution of SCC estimates that we get, we have numbers that range between 40 and $70 depending on the emissions trajectory that you're on. So a higher emissions trajectory means a hotter climate, means you're at a more convex part of that damage function, which raises your SCC. If we then value the uncertainty using, uh, using um, a standard constant relative risk aversion uh, utility function, these numbers increase, particularly for RCP7. If we additionally use equity weighting, these numbers move around a little bit as well. There's a difference between the certainty equivalent and equity weighting of, of, of $4, but basically, um, you know, the idea here is that each one of these decisions can dramatically shape uh, uh, the direction that the number goes. 
the last column now endogenized is a discount rate using the Ramsey formula. Happy to talk about that if people are interested. Um, and this assumption will change the discount rate for each uh, socioeconomic uh, scenario in each location. And, and we can see those numbers change uh, quite substantially. So again, these are sort of like a handful of numbers um, and, and we're working on uh, building a database of a lot more estimates of SCCs because these sort of key decisions about how you treat um, uncertainty, equity, and, and discounting are obviously of first order importance for the final number. Um, just before I wrap up, you know, this entire approach is, is building up from sector specific damages. And so that sort of inherently means there are additional sector sector specific estimates that that you know can and should be included here and so we are actively working on additional sectors and we also are really hoping we can build this um, up into something that's publicly accessible enough to be able to integrate with with other scientists um, to, to sort of fill out this space and i'll just end by thanking my many collaborators at the climate impact lab that have um, helped shape a lot of these papers thank you all so much for your time So that was uh, that was a very uh, comprehensive <laughs> uh, talk. Um, if there are any more questions, uh, you know, we have about five, ten minutes. Uh, we can take them. Um, I'll just wait um, in case anyone has any. Um, I, I have one. So let me just uh, bring that up and then uh, we can maybe conclude. Um, so I have the one thing that, you know, you said that there was a lot of inequality in, in these damages across. Do you have a sense of the inequality also in the variation, not just, uh, you know, the, uh, the the average? So is, is the variation higher in places where you have uh, not as great data? I mean, that's what I'd expect. Um, yeah, you're saying is the sort of like the risk or the risk faced by poorer populations or maybe hotter populations in terms of the like variance of their projections higher than in a wealthier place or place where we have a lot more data behind the model. Is that yeah. kind of the question? Yeah. 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 That's a great question. We actually had, um, we made a figure to address this for the mortality sector. Um, I don't remember if it stayed in the paper or not. And um, it wasn't as clear as we it wasn't you know super compelling it was like pretty noisy um okay. so i think i i don't remember it being super clear but it's not something we've systematically done across the sectors and i think it's a it's a really interesting point and and worth us looking into more yeah yeah uh, okay. i have a question yep. right so it's uh it's slightly different from the question that kanishk was asking and that it has to do with climate change per se, right? Because it's not just about the world getting hotter. It's also about the variability that is coming with it. And it, it becomes all the more difficult to predict, okay, you know, uh, because the variance is increasing. We are less and less confident of, you know, which, uh, what would be the actual change. And this would result in a higher adaptation cost also, right? So how are you incorporating this variability? Yeah, great question. Um, only to the extent that people are today. So we, um, you know, all of our estimates of say the crop yield impact of heat include, we, you know, we are very careful to include the full daily distribution of exposure. So it's not like an average annual temperature, but I think you're getting at something more nuanced, which is, um, my measure of adaptation says in an average hot place, I'm more adapted to that hot day. But if in the future, an average hot place also has a higher variance, and that is a differential adaptive effect, that's not included in our estimate. And so I think there's there's really, I think I've seen a couple of papers that have begun to, to do this, where um, instead of just like long run average conditions shaping the those response curve, you actually look at other moments of that distribution, like the variance, um, and I'm trying blanking on the paper that I read that, that did this recently, but um, I think there's a lot of reason to hypothesize that could matter. And you should think about our estimates as, as ignoring any change in variance that would influence adaptation. We're only thinking about how the mean, the long run mean may, may shape your ad adaptive decisions. Yeah, great question. All right, um, so if there are no more questions, I'm going to formally close uh, and
want to thank our speaker and participants for a very interesting uh, presentation and talk.